you know, I started on my first experience on set was as an extra mm-hmm. um, in a Lorenzo Lamas movie. We're talking uh, about like the 90s. 80s. Late, late, late maybe, 90s. maybe it was late 80s, something like that. This episode is brought to you by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. Learn more at IndieFilmHustle.tv. I'd like to welcome to the show, Thomas Jane. How you doing, Thomas? Hey, good to see you. Hello. Good to see you, t- good to see you too, my friend. I'm, uh, I'm excited to have you on the show. I've been a fan of yours, my friend, from back, 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 back in the day. So I appreciate you coming on, and I'm excited to, uh, to talk to you about your new projects and the new stuff that you're doing in the world. But before we get into all of that, yeah. why in God's green earth did you want to get into this insane business? <laughs> wow. There's a question. Why did I want to? I think it's a kind of business that's sort of like uh, you don't really have a choice. I mean, I, I think if you could do anything else, I, I, coming up as a young actor, anybody in my acting classes that had a, a plan B, you know, whether it was managing a restaurant or going to night school to be an accountant, that's what they ended up doing. Mm. So one of the first things I learned was no plan B. Um, Gosh, you, you know, I mean, the, you burn the you burn the ships, you burn the ships at the shore. You got to. I mean, otherwise you're gonna. There are nights when you lay awake in bed at night, staring at the ceiling and going, "Why the hell am I here? And what the hell did I think I was doing?" There are those nights, you know. And if you've got that, you know, escape hatch, sooner or later you're gonna get weak and take it. So yes, you got to burn the ships, man. There's no way out. So let me ask you a question then. I mean, look, as an actor, I, I'm always fascinated by, you know, when I'm when I'm directing and I, I'm doing a casting, I try to be as kind as I can to actors, but they get rejected mm-hmm. 99% of the time, yep. especially when they're coming up, if not 100% of the time when they're coming up. Right. How did you deal with rejection coming up? How did you just keep going and grinding every day when there, there was nothing on the horizon that said, if you stick with this, is you're going to make it? Yeah. You know, how did you do it? There's only one way to do it. And that's to love what you do. I started a little theater company here in Los Angeles in the bad part of town on Heliotrope and Melrose. Mm -hmm. We rented out in literally a store space and we called it the space and we built our own. We got our our seats from some abandoned theater and we built the tiers and, and I think it sat 49 people. Uh, and we built our stage and put up some lights and we started directing, acting, writing. Even I did a one act play there that I wrote. Um, and you get a group of guys together that just really love it. You know, and we, of course, we're all doing it for free. You know, uh, tickets were negligible, if not free, you know, and you get all your buddies to come on one weekend and the second weekend, there'll be three people and one of them will be asleep in the yeah. audience. And snoring <laughs> i've had it i've had i've been there yeah <laughs> but if you love what you do and it's like well where can i do this and even if i have to invent my own place to do it um you know and that leads to friends and some other guys got a another theater and really that's i did a lot of theater in la and you don't want you don't think of la as a theater town but there's a, there's a little bit going on. There's a great theater called the Odyssey down in Laguna Beach. Mm-hmm. That's a union theater. I did a, I did a play there with Sherry North, who used to be called the, uh, the smart Marilyn Monroe back in the day. <laughs> and and uh, I just kept, I kept that up. I haven't done theater in a long time because I've been busy doing this, but I'd love to get back to it. So... The question and the answer is love what you do. And if you love what you do, you'll find a way to do it. And it doesn't really matter. And, you know, I, I ultimately said to myself, you know, it doesn't really matter if I never get paid for this. I love to do it. Mm-hmm. You've got to, I've got, I love what it does. And I love to watch it. You know, I love to go to the, I, I became an usher at a theater in uh, century city, just so I could go and watch the play every night, you know, and watch the different changes and how it was the same, but different every night. I was a bad usher because I was kept watching the play instead of showing people to their seats. But other than ushering, <laughs> uh, 
So, so you when you get your first gig as a as a paid actor on a movie or a TV show, what was that like? Just going on the set for the first time, knowing that you're gonna remember some lines, and even it could have been just one line, but sure. just be just being there. What was that like for you? And did you throw up? Did you have imposter uh, syndrome? All that stuff, kind of stuff. All of the above. It's a new experience for sure. But you know, I started out. My first experience on set was as an extra. Mm -hmm. um in a lorenzo llamas movie we're talking uh, about like the 90s 80s maybe, maybe it was late 80s something like that and i played soccer in the background of some scene that they were shooting right uh -huh. and uh watching lorenzo llamas do his he had this towel and he would puff, puff up his biceps before each shot you know and i was like well that's interesting and just watch, watching the crew, watching the people is all new to me. I had no idea what anybody's job was, but they sure were busy. And then at the end of the day, you line up to, to the, at the, at this makeshift table where they would hand out your paycheck. And when I, when I got over there, they packed up and gone. Oh. So, you know, I was, I was only supposed to get like 40 bucks or something, but that 40 bucks meant a lot. That pissed me off. So I like doing productions where people actually pay the, the, the people that right. are working and, and respect the uh, yeah. different jobs that people do, you know. Um, then I started getting, I guess maybe it was Buffy the Vampire Slayer, where yeah. it was like a real movie. And I, and I had a, a, a few, I had a scene um, with Luke, Luke Perry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and. I played this garage mechanic and he's kind of crazy. And, and that was really my first experience of getting into the makeup trailer and just being thrown through the works and the process and on the set and doing your scene and the coverage and all that. And yeah, it's, it's uh, exhilarating and terrifying and, uh, and fascinating and uh, everything you'd think it would be. I remember Luke was in his, makeup trailer and he was talking to his agents on the phone and they were arguing because he had this what do you call a jazz button he had this little flavor saver the flavor saver yeah <laughs> and it was clean shaven except for that and he was he was arguing with the producers and the agent about whether or not he was going to keep it or shave it off of course they wanted him to shave it off he ended up keeping it um He's, yeah, it was funny because I because I knew the um, I knew Fran, the director of, of Buffy um, years ago. I, I I hung out with her and she would tell me stories about what it was like being on that set and mm. running. it. I think it was her second movie or something like that. And it was a studio movie. And, and, and what a neat Luke, group of people. Oh, and Luke Perry was like at the mm -hmm. height of his power. I mean, he was the star of that, yeah. you know, even though it was Christie's, you know, she was the Buffy. But he I mean, people Hollywood don't understand. Star. Yeah, I mean, uh, I lived in Orlando. I mean, excuse me, I lived in Florida when that mall that he went to go visit, there was a riot and like mm -hmm. people. Oh my gosh, yeah. I was, I drove by that that day. I was like, what's going on over here? I was living in Fort Lauderdale at the time. And it was, so people didn't understand how big of a star he was back then. So that must have been a hell of an experience just being around great. that. Yeah, <laughs> and I, I met a lot of people on that set, David Arquette. Yeah, and, uh, Paul Rubens, you know, oh. we're still friends today. Uh, it was a great set. It was a great group of people, that film. Now, mm -hmm. speaking of some films, I mean, you've worked with a couple of good directors, just a couple mm -hmm. over the years. Uh, you've had the pleasure of working with like Terrence Malick and P.T. Anderson and John Woo. Uh, mm -hmm. are, did you learn any lessons from about filmmaking that you brought into your directing, into your producing years later or just as an actor what are some lessons you learned from some of these great filmmakers always you know they all got different styles i learned that i learned that there's no one one way to do it mm -hmm. um and i'm always paying attention because i do love directing and producing and uh and i've always been headed in that direction um once you get a little experience you know i feel like i have something to offer uh and avoid some of the some of the pitfalls that I've fallen into in the past and have seen people fall into, it's, it's really nice. It's neat to, it's an oral tradition, you know, that there's no, you can read some books, but there's only one way to really learn how to, how it, how it happens. And that is to do it. And you're in your learning hand to mouth, you're learning 
sorry, mouth to ear. It's people teaching other people how to do it. And, and, it, and that process for acting has gone back 2000 years. Mm-hmm. For filmmaking, it's gone back 100 years more. Um, but you've got, and it's technicians and artists teaching other technicians and artists. And so, and I love that, that tradition, you know, there's no other way to learn it except for to be there and to learn it from people who learned it from somebody else. Mm-hmm. And for, as far as those guys, you know, uh, I love Terry Malick's um, style. It was very open. He was very open to the environment and to what the actors were doing. And, 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 and he would be able to shift. He was fluid. He was extremely fluid in the way that he, what he wanted. He would change his mind. I was, I had this scene on a hill. It was one scene and he'd asked me to be in the movie three times before. And I was busy doing other stuff. Uh, and he finally, I was free. And so I flew all the way over there. I flew with Mickey Rourke mm-hmm. and, we, and we had to take like three planes <laughs> and Mickey kept getting lost. And I felt like I was kind of babysit. He, he hates flying apparently. So I was kind of taking care of Mickey. And, and then I went over and I got to watch Mickey. So of course I wasn't working, but Mickey was doing his stuff one day and I showed up and all day long watched Terry and Mickey and Mickey was doing improv and he improv all day. Beautiful monologue, gorgeous work. Didn't end up in the film, but uh, my scene did. And I tell you, we started at dawn and we shot the scene. And then throughout the day, there'd be cloud cover and he'd shoot the scene. And then there'd be sunshine and he'd shoot the scene. I knew just enough at that time to be able to ask him like, how are you going to cut this together? You've, you, you we're shooting in the sun. We're shooting in the shade. You've got us at dawn. How's any of this going to match? And he said, you know what? I'm, sh- I'm shooting, I'm covering this scene so that I can take all of the cloud cover shots and put the scene together and I'll have, or I can take all the sunshine, sunshine, sunshine shots and put those together. Or I can have, we shot at dusk and dawn. I can have a magic hour scene because that way I can put the scene anywhere in the film that I like, because it's a kind of a standalone, it's a standalone little scene. So it's not really connected to any other part of the story. I thought that, okay, that's kind of brilliant. And then halfway through the day, he disappeared for like three hours. Him and John Toll just ran off and, uh, or it's, so we're sitting around for three hours. He finally comes strolling back. I go, Hey, uh, <laughs> where you been? And, uh, and he said, Oh, I saw some beautiful butterflies. <laughs> we're just over there. And we were, we were catch, we were filming them. Anyway, where were we? <laughs> <laughs> so you literally just went off to chase some, some, some butterflies. Oh my God. That's amazing. Literally. L- yeah. literally literally that's, yeah, it's it's so, uh, yeah i've learned a lot from different folks john Wu, john yeah. Wu, he actually he had a funny way because this was a movie he was shooting in america he had an american crew he was out of his element he wasn't with his normal guys doing a john Wu movie he was doing a hollywood movie hired because he's john Wu. John Wu was very smart. He, he speaks fluent English, but during the show, he pretended that he didn't speak any English. So when the producers are trying to talk to him, he'd be like, huh, what, what's he, what are they saying? Well, and then he had this interpreter and the interpreter would be trying to explain. And jo- So he had this out, he built this out for himself where he just did whatever the hell he wanted. And if the producers got upset, be like, sorry, he was just a misunderstanding. John doesn't speak English. You know, we're doing the best we can. And I thought, okay, <laughs> that's pretty clever. But did you know, but did you know on set that he didn't speak English? I found, no, I watched him and I watched all the interpreting and all this stuff. And, and he had his little Chinese group around him that were very protective. And, and it was, I was able to, uh, to, somebody told me, Somebody told me at the end of the uh, the day, I was made friends with somebody who was on John's team, and he told me the straight, the, the real deal. Oh my God, that's that's uh, that's yeah, because John, I mean, watching it was a face, it was face off, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Yeah. So yeah, a classic John Wu film. 
um, and they need to make a sequel of it uh, as soon as humanly possible. Yeah. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. But I mean, he's just one of those directors, you know, he he rewrote how action movies were made after he came That's out. right. He sure did. Everything's, everything's uh, never the same after the bullet ballet. Oh, my God. After Hard Boiled and uh, oh, Hard Boiled and uh, well, the other one he did, The Killer. Oh, just the killer. Bullet yeah, I love I love bullet, that. bullet in the I head. Loved, uh, what's the star? What did he who did he keep? Using? Oh, uh, Ch- Chan Wen Fat. Oh, God. He was great. Oh, he was. Oh, what a face. What a face you know, what he didn't a... have to do anything. It was just one of those faces. It's like Toshiro Mifune. You know, you're, oh. just, you're just fascinated by this guy. I'm watching, uh, I've watched all the Kurosawa stuff, but it turns sure. out Mifune did more movies with this Japanese director called Inaki. I think it's called In- Inaki. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he did more movies with this guy in Japan, but those movies never really made it outside of Japan. They were very Japanese. Mm-hmm. Um, and his work with this, this guy is just as good as Kurosawa in a, diff- in a different way. But have you seen the Samurai trilogy? Yeah, I remember the Samurai trilogy. Yeah, oh, it's amazing. I just watched that recently, and oh. I, I hadn't seen it. That, that is, it's like a six-hour movie divided up into three films. Yeah, so. it's on Criterion. It's a Criterion collection. Yeah, and you've got it's the story of Musashi, who was this the most famous samurai, and it's sort of his journey from being this ruffian, this kid, this wild child kid, to being a real samurai, and his and his journey along the way and it took six hours to tell the story it it's now up in my top five i love the way he sh- and it's so simply done and i love those older films where they just hang on a shot you know it's they're not doing all these cuts and when they cut into a close-up it's me it means something you're like whoa uh they would let a whole scene play out just in the just in the master you know and the actors would be choreographed so they'd be moving i love that kind of work and i'm just hoping that that i can do some of that kind of work and that people don't get bored you know i i think that we need i think it's desensitizing all of the all of the the television cutting that's sort of permeating our world right now and has been for years and years but now it's now it's been sort of sunk into it. It's like everything has become it, you know? Mm-hmm. There used to be a difference between television editing and movie editing. And, mm-hmm. now yeah. and now you've got pretty much everything's TV. And I think somebody, maybe me, is, gonna, is going to turn that on its head again where we just let it play because the actors are damn interesting. The story's interesting. I can see everybody. I see what they're doing. You know, if you got a wide shot or a medium shot, I see all the expressions on your face. I pick it up. Um, and I, I think that uh, we, we, we need as an audience and as we move through time and society, we, we need things to kind of wake us up a little bit. You know, mm-hmm. you have to break out of the pattern a little bit in order to wake people back up to the power and the glory of uh, cinematic storytelling. Now, when, when you're working as an actor, what do you look for in a director? You know, how do you like to be directed? What is that, those elements that when you're thinking about doing a project, you're like, mm, this is not going to work out because we're not going to mix here. Or, I really am looking, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. This girl doesn't know what she's like. I, I, you could say, I'm assuming at this point, you can sense this as a third, as a sixth sense now. So what is that thing that you're looking for in a director? Oh, you know, I can take care of myself now. So I used to want a director who could really uh, who, who was going to get the best performance out of me. I found that those are few and far between. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just sort of becoming a lost art where, where directors really understand. There's a few of them out there. But uh, as far as working with actors, I got that covered. I can take care of my performance. What I'm what I'm hoping and looking for is can you take care of your directing? <laughs> so I like if somebody comes to me with storyboards and says, this is how I'm going to shoot this. This is my vision for this thing. And if they don't say anything, you're like, well, you're just going to show up and make it up on the day, which unfortunately I have, you know, work we've all worked with. It's like, oh, we'll figure it out. And by the way, that can work. That's a, you know, that's if, a style. If, if, that, Ridley, if Ridley Scott shows up and says, hey, we're just going to figure it out on the day, yeah, you're good. <laughs> Right. You trust that. But and that and that can work. But I like an I like a director to be prepared and to, and to have a point of view 
and to involve me in that story. You know, how are we going to tell that? Uh, how can I help you tell the story that you want to tell? So I'm being folded into a grander picture, not just showing up and, you know, we'll make it up on the day. It's, it's what you're looking for is, is a vision. You're also looking for a sensitivity to the acting. You know, you don't have to direct it. Some of the best directors I've worked with don't say anything. They don't direct you. Their direction is extremely minimal. You know, things like a little bit faster can mean the world in a scene. Um, generally, directors uh, want to say as little as possible to their actors. But to know that you're being taken care of means to be, know that you're being watched. So you're they're paying attention they're intently focused on what you're doing and they see everything so a director comes up after a take and goes that, mo that pause you took before you picked up that that fork <laughs> fantastic and then walk away so i'm being able to piece together what's working and what's not working with little comments like that yeah because when you get because I've, I've I've been on set with very insecure directors and insecure directors are yellers and and they're trying to you know boast their ego and and all this kind of stuff and I, I've always found that the quieter the director the more secure they are it's the quiet ones that you'd really yeah they, you know, they just I mean, with one word faster more intense the, those couple words <laughs> that's by, by, by the time if a good director has done his job by the time you get to set the movie's already made <laughs> You're just executing the motions and all the every, all the crew knows what to do. Everybody, there's little adjustments to make throughout the day, but they've, there's been production meetings that have been very thorough and everybody knows exactly what's required on that day and what this scene is about. You know, like Lumet said, he's like, I sit everybody down and, and we all have to be making the same movie. You know, and, and that's the conversation during production meetings is what kind of movie are we making? Because you can make any kind of movie. You can take a script and turn it into a you, you can take the darkest film and turn it into a comedy or vice versa. It's the, the page is really is a skeleton, you know, and no matter how good the script is, you're looking at a skeleton that can be interpreted and built in many different ways. So if you've got a group of 20 artists you know, they're all going to kind of have their own proclivities and ideas and stuff. And if you just let them run, you're going to get 20, you're going to get a Frankenstein movie. But if you're able to coalesce and everybody's making the same film, and then when they come to set and they have a question, you can remind them and say, nope, that's not the movie. And, and so you're now you're just nudging people onto the path. Right. As opposed to just, you know, running away. Well, there's 20 different ways we could get to town, you know? <laughs> exactly. Now, you know, being an actor of your caliber and, and being in the business for as long as you have, I'm imagining that you get pitched projects all the time from filmmakers, mm. from producers who want you to be a part of their show or be part of their movie or something along those lines. Knock on wood. Knock yeah. on wood. That keeps happening. Right. And, uh, and you deserve it because you are, you know, you've had, you've built a hell of a career for yourself and done some Thank amazing you. work, but I, you know, being in the indie space and, and, you know, now you're, you're working a lot in, in independent projects as well that are, you know, outside of the, $300 million studio system, though you do those every once in a while as well. I really enjoy the indie space. I really do. What is a, what is the proper way that someone could put a package together to entice a, an actor of your caliber? Like what elements should be in place? What elements shouldn't be in place? Don't do this, do this because there's so many, I feel like I consult constantly to independent filmmakers and they'll just do the, you know, for, uh, the ignorant things that they just don't understand. Like, uh, you can't reach out to Thomas without mm. some money in place. Uh, that's step one. I don't care how beautiful the script might be. His agents are not going to even look at it unless there's verifiable funds, things True. like that. So, so yeah, what are some of the things, some, some tips you can give some filmmakers out there? Well, it all starts with the script, you know, mm -hmm. obviously. You've got to have a script that's going to be attractive, Um for and there's a number of different ways there's an endless amount of ways you can pull that off but you got to have a script that's attractive you got to have a script that's meaningful to 
actors. Um, the most important things, like you said, is that the film is set up or there's financing that is ready to be in place. You know, most financiers will say, OK, I'll commit to making this movie if you bring me Thomas Jane. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so you can you there's a meeting in, uh, in the middle where, you know, so you don't so you don't necessarily have to be fully financed, but you have to have the means to be financed. You have to, so it really is a director. You're always, you're starting with the money, you know, you need your producers and you need your money. And in that way, you can start to build uh, your package. You know, I think everything's becoming a package these days. It's, it's, it's about who you're pairing with. So when you're crafting your script, make sure you have more than one good part <laughs> because the guys who are able to get a whole movie finance, they've got little scripts lined up around the block of, of waiting, waiting for them. They could pick any movie they want, you know? And, and so those, that's, that's not a good route. I mean, you're going to get in line. It's going to be three blocks down that way. Mm -hmm. But if you put a pack, if you have a film and a script, you put it together and you've got a number of different neat parts and they, it could be just a two day part, you know, a, a, re a really fun part that's, that works for two days. Those work really well. And uh, that's how you're, uh, you're able to attract an actor i won't read it's just, it's just too much stuff you know i just mm -hmm. don't have time to read stuff that doesn't have any financing or nobody's looked at it however as a producer now i've started a company called renegade mm -hmm. and uh tropo our tv show for amazon is our first is our first project it's really exciting mm -hmm. and the we we do read scripts you know, we read script. We're looking for great scripts so that we can then take it out to the financiers and and start to put that together. So that's sort of your first stop. The first stop would be Renegade. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, send it into my production company, which is yeah, which is which is um, which is very very cool of you to, to like you've launched this new company and you're doing some really cool projects with the com with the company yeah. as well, um, and you're taking kind of more control as an actor. Mm -hmm. over the work that you're doing so you're not just you know a gun for hire you're actually trying to put that's this right together. and i'm also and also not everything that we do has to be starring thomas jane you know so it's not a thomas jane production company it's a real production company we started in 2019 so we're just getting started because then the pandemic hit right away right right one of the first things we grabbed was stephen king's from a buick eight i know i saw that that's really exciting so many people have tried to crack it as a film john carpenter uh can't remember the other names but a lot of people have come on and tried to nail that down as a but it's really it's too long form to it needs to be a miniseries mm -hmm. so we've got some really good partners in place to create turn that into a miniseries um and that's uh one of the things we've got and then the tropo book came across our desk that was one of the first things that come around uh, so looking for books, looking for projects, looking for material, that's the fun. That's really fun, you know, like, oh, this could be. And then shepherding that material in a way that so that it doesn't get compromised or damaged along the way, right. which which is probably the toughest job in Hollywood, you know, besides <laughs> writing. Writing the script is the toughest job. The second toughest job is being able to take a decent piece of material and shepherd it from A to Z without completely altering it so that it's unrecognizable uh, mm -hmm. or, or, you know, twisting it in a way that it turns into something that's not what you intended or what you fell in love with at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, I mean, and you as, as a, you know, someone who's shepherding a project like that, you are the protector of the material. That's right. Uh, you are the protector of the material and you have to be a strong guardian. And a lot of times filmmakers, get you know producers will come in or the studio will come in or someone else will start pushing it around to the point where you've lost control of it and now you've lost you've not you're not protecting it anymore there's so many different ways that things can go off the rails and you need to make decisions that do change things a bit especially if you're going from a book to, to the screen from page mm -hmm. to screen you need to make adjustments you know and the adjustments that you make you have to always keep in the forefront of your mind. Does this serve the core of this project 
or or is it compromising it in some way? And then there will be compromises, you know. Oh, you, every day, maybe, every day of every second, there's a compromise. The whole the whole the filmmaking world. process is compromise. Right. It's making yeah. the right compromises, and then it's it's making compromises that in turn protect the thing that you love the best about it, right? right? So identifying that and being able to when you make those compromises, make sure that they're still serving what you love about the project in some way, you know? So you, you can, you can, there's certain things that you can lose and, and still not compromise your project. There are certain things that you can change and you've ruined it. <laughs> oh, one little, one little thing. You lifting that fork a little too fast, the whole movie's <laughs> gone off the rails. <laughs> Well, I mean, the scene might go off the rails. But, <laughs> no, no, but, but you know, it's like a butterfly flaps its wings, and there's a there's a you know an avalanche somewhere, uh, <laughs> kind of thing. When Everything you, has a reverberation, and you know, yeah. it comes from experience, knowing what kind of compromises you can make and how, and what you on what and what you're protecting, what you can't compromise. Now, as far as that package you were talking about before, I mean, verifiable funds, or at least being able to verify those funds, how important to you is the creative packaging team, like the producers involved, the director, if it's a first time director, you know, because I know a lot of you know, a lot of actors who just won't work with first time directors because they just don't have the time to, to, to take that risk on their either their career or their time or any of that stuff. So how oh, important? How important is that team? And also, I mean, obviously your co-stars who you're going to be working with and so on. And I'm, I'm asking these questions because a lot of filmmakers out there listening don't understand the realities of what it really takes to get a film off the ground, especially in today's world. So I wanted, okay. to, I wanted to come straight from the horse's mouth, if you will. Well, if you're a first time director, I would start small. Find a project that you can make that's your calling card. You know, don't go try to get a bunch of big actors in your first time move. It's getting rarer and rarer. Oh. And for a reason, you're right. We don't have the time and we just don't want to take the risk. I mean, the, the chances are your movie is going to be pretty flawed if you're a first time director, you know, uh, and that's, that's just the way it is. But if you're making a film uh, that you can't, and now it's so easy, you know, if that you can put together that that's your calling card. And if somebody shows me that and goes, Hey, check this out. Hopefully not a short, but a short you can't. You can still get an idea of of uh, of what a director is capable of through a short. And you know there might be some time if I had a really fantastic script and I had a great short and the part was great, then there, then I might take that risk. But if one of those three isn't there, I just don't have time. You know, right. Uh, starting small as a director, you know, uh, so that you can create something that's um, exciting and uh, for, you know, and, and then, you know, and then the producers will be able to go around town and say, look, man, this guy made this in six days. Imagine what he'll do if we give him 18, <laughs> 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 you know, uh, and, and that becomes a, a selling point. But um, as far as what, what, what would you like to know? Well, like, the, so like, I mean, what you just said, like those three elements, like great script, great part, great short yeah. film is an anomaly. It happens once in a blue moon. And then also there's the personality aspects, the, the almost the like, can I sit in a room with this or can I be on a set with this person for 12 to 18 hours sometimes, depending on the project? Yeah. And I mean, yeah. You know, those are those elements as well about what entices an actor like yourself to be part of a project. And again, I'm just trying to really hammer home to filmmakers who are listening that this is this is the reality because i hear it every day thomas every day hear? i hear i hear filmmakers who like hey you know who's going to be perfect for this it's going to be thomas jane i'm like okay great what do you have and they're like i've got this script what have you done nothing do you have any money almost i almost money's going to drop i'm like no 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 no. do you have verifiable funds do you have an right. a, a qualified investor no okay right. Do right. you have an agent? Don't have an agent yet. Do you have a right. lawyer? Right. We're right. looking for one. But you see, but this is the delusion of a lot of independent filmmakers because they're ignorant to the process. And that's what mm -hmm. my show mm -hmm. is all about, is trying to really guide them through the process so I can mm. at least cut a couple years off of their, their learning lessons and uh -huh. not waste two years trying to get to your agent, right. trying to get a script to your agent, and then getting right. angry. I'm like, oh, Hollywood doesn't understand my genius. Right, uh, right, right. <laughs> That script, you want to put that in a drawer and then you want to make the one that's going to get you in the door, you know, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. We really is, you know, it's show and tell around here. There's, you know, people talk bullshit all day long. And pe- some people are really good at it. Some people make a career at it. Um, <laughs> I've met the same people, sir. <laughs> so, but, but if you, you know, if you can do it, if you can do it once, you can do it again. You can make, and, it, you, you, and start with a financing, you know, start with, and that, I guess, you know, in a lot of ways, the, the producing part really is tough. Because finding somebody who can recognize what a good script is or recognize what a talented director is. And I think that's one of the frustrations of people starting out. You know, it's like if only they knew how how brilliant I am. Show us. Show us. Show us. You know, it's show and tell. And it, and that and that can be a short film, but you know if you could if you can put together uh, and I, you know and it and what's great about it doing something like that is it could be a half hour long, it could be forty five minutes long, an hour, an hour and five minutes. You know you're not beholden to any kind of uh, r- rules except for making something really damn interesting. Now holding somebody's attention on a really low budget. Uh, thing for an hour is miraculous. <laughs> no, no, there's no question. For a half an hour, it's miraculous. If you're going to make a short, keep it under ten minutes. Uh, you know, and p- p- those rules are made to be broken. But you know, if I see a short, you know, and it's forty five minutes long, I'll watch some of it. Mm-hmm. But the chances are really small that I'll get through the whole thing. <laughs> right, exactly, because forty five minutes shorts. I'm like, just keep going. But you need a combination. You can't just make a brilliant short film and show you got to have you need that combination, you know, and uh, yeah. Yeah. And I think building your team early is good. You know, find ways to hook up with really talented writers, young, because the young writers, when I was coming up, I was fortunate enough to find some really talented writers who are now making livings as screenplay. But we were living hand to mouth. But we love what we did. So we would get together at night after our day jobs and we'd spend three, four hours writing together, you know, and developing stuff. And that really those scripts, if I look back at them today, they're not very good, but they're kind, but there's moments of brilliance in them, you know, and that and that's how you kind of cut your teeth. That's how I cut my teeth was. And I did short films. I got to tell you, I wish somebody would dig these up. I did films for UCLA, Mm -hmm. USC. I would go and I would audition, you know, these uh, graduate uh, filmmakers, directors. They needed to make their thesis film, you know, uh, and it was usually a short. And I got I did like four or five of them uh, and had a great time, you know, and and met met all kinds of wonderful people and. And uh, but really, you know, we were cutting our teeth. So I did short films. I wrote with young writers who they're not expecting to get paid, you know, mm-hmm. but they 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 love it, too. They're learning, too. They want to do it. And then, you know, if, if you're lucky enough, you'll find you'll meet some really interesting young producers and, the, and making those connections is great but but cutting your teeth on an actual project that everybody's just doing because they need to do it i i I think is the most important thing yeah you've got to you actually it's one of those this is an art form that needs to be you if you want to paint paint you want to play music play music you can't just talk about it so much or or intel intellectualize it until you're on it's it's mouth to it's mouth to ear man it's the only way to do it yeah, and, and until you're on set and, and shrapnel is being tossed at you, literally and figuratively sometimes, yeah, you learn. You'll learn on the first day when you're directing and right. the, the, you're losing the light and yeah. you've got three pages left right. and, and there's yeah. no way. Nobody's there, coming back tomorrow. Everybody's and going no, home. And we lose the location at six. That's right. That's the stuff they don't teach you at school. That's then the you stuff that you're thinking on your feet, you know. Then you're like, okay, how can I cover this scene in the next 15 minutes that I'm not going to lose the scene and, and I can save? Or my how movie. can I rewrite it so that I get the right. essence of what's being done? And then a lot of times that'll turn out better than your three minute scene. Right. I always love. I always love going on set, uh, especially with the fir- when I'm working with the first AD the first time. I come in and I'll have a shot list of like a hundred shots for the right. day, and he's like. Uh, you know, we're not going to get them like, absolutely. I know we're not going to get to this, but I want them there in case right. things are going well, or maybe I can right. switch here. And, but I'd like right. to have that there. So just, and that's right. experience. Right. Cause, right. cause the first yeah. time I went on set with that list, 
I expected to do all of it. You do all of it, yeah. You're like, well, why not? <laughs> why, why can't do we do right 200 here. setups? Right here. <laughs> it's 200, 200 setups in, in eight hours. I got it all worked out. <laughs> <laughs> I saw this behind the scenes documentary of Tarantino. I think it could work out fine. <laughs> now there yeah, is- um, so Are your guys just starting out or are they young professionals and they're trying to get first moved off the ground? They're, it's a bunch of different people. It's from the, it's from the newbie who doesn't understand the, the things that we've discussed all the way right. to the experienced directors who have worked- Right. Uh, and, and worked on projects, been in the business for 15, 20 years, yeah. but still might not understand the producing side of things and how to package a, how to package a it's project. It's true. There's like a secret language to producing. Even I am still learning about the ins and outs of this secret language that they've got. You know, and obviously they've got little lists, you know, and if the actors aren't on the list and they're, every actor is worth a certain amount of money this week and they'll be a, worth a certain amount of money next week. And that kind of fluctuates. And then if you put certain actors in combination together, then that gets you, it really, it's a financial puzzle that the producers put together so that they don't take a bath when they make your movie, you know, so it's, they want to have us a, 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 a a floor they want to have a concrete floor that they're not going to fall beneath and just disappear forever they, right. they need they need that insurance uh and that comes through who who you got in your movie and you know i think one of the big hurdles like i said is finding a producer who really understands what the potential of your project is because those producers are the guys that are going to be able to go out there and talk to the financiers and figure out different models. And there's several different ways to skin the cat, which way is best at this time and, and place with this script, with this cast. So there, there's a lot of different elements and it takes years to figure out this producing stuff. You know, people, oh. But, but beyond, but that anybody can figure that out. That's math. What the magic sauce is, is being able to recognize a, a really good script, you know, that, that has the potential to make a really good film in a way that we haven't seen 99 times. People, why are they making all these sequels and why are, what's all these remakes? Because it's already been proven to work. Nobody wants to take a step outside the formula because then you're in no man's land. You're in the unknown. You know, you're like, you don't, you can't pull up the list of numbers and say, well, this movie did this and this movie did that. This was released on Labor Day and it did this. So, and there's all kinds of numbers surrounding that. What's not surrounding is when you come up with something unique enough that it becomes an unknown. Then, you, you know, you really, you need to fall back on your, these are the actors I've got. These are the parts that are, that are available, you know, generally men mean more than women in this crazy business. You know, that I still don't understand that one, but somehow it's still a thing, you know, where a, a male movie star will bring more financing to a project than a female movie star in most cases. That's strange to me, but part of the bit, it's just math. It's like insurance companies, you know, they're like, we don't care. It's, you know, this many, this many people die of car accidents on this road. Therefore, if you want, you know, if you want to drive on it, this is what you got to pay. So. And those, uh, and those rules, by the way, change daily. They change daily. These little, this little time, light. constantly fluid. And the, and the producers who are tuned in are monitoring those fluctuations all the time, you know, and then where you can shoot monitors, then you get your rebates, you know, oh, yeah. everybody would go to Louisiana because you'd get this great rebate. You go to Georgia. That's why Walking Dead and all these other things shoot in Georgia. They get a tax rebate. But that's when I was shooting Hung for HBO, we'd go to Detroit for a couple of weeks. Right. Every year. We got this great rebate. But then, you know, they uh, they've played fast and loose with their rebate money and it dried up. So now you don't go to Detroit anymore. Now you go to New Jersey. <laughs> it's, it's, it's always fluctuating. No, it's, 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 and, and, you know, another thing I, I, I discovered, I, I worked on a project where there was a, a name actor who they brought on and then, but the, and the filmmaker was working with them and it's the thing that financed the project. But then by the time the movie came out, that actor had diluted his value for the year. And there was 12 by, other movies. By doing too many movies. He did 12 other movies that year. Oh, that's a lot. That's a lot of movies. And then and he went out to the distribution. And he completely valued his name. So then the, the then the filmmaker who that was with his that was his 
game, he went to distributors. I'm like, I already got three of his movies this year. I'm like, oh. right. That's like, a problem. You don't want to yeah. do that. Um, as an and, actor, you, I'm assuming and, you and, think and, about this as well. As an actor, you're like, I can't be in everything. Actor, because- you got to say, yeah, you can't flood the market with too much product. It's supply and demand. Um, but some years are different than others. You know, uh, one year, you know, you're like, I, I've got to pay off this, this, uh, debt, you know, I've, I've got, so I, I've got to do it. And then, but you know, that then you're probably going to not work the next year for a while. You, you want to keep that supply and demand going. You also want to be, you can't work too little because then, you know, then you're like, well, we don't know what your value is because the last movie you had came out five years ago. It's a totally different business now. I don't know. And then you're a wild card and people don't really want to invest in that. But I think as an actor, um, one of the things that I think that I hope that I've had found some success in is choosing projects. You know, if what what I like, what I hope for is that the projects that I do are at least going to be interesting. There's going to be it's not going to be some shitty script, you know, and by the way, I've done it. But, but, <laughs> but but hopefully not a lot, you know, like maybe once or twice I've done a script where I was like, oh God, I really, I really need to pay the rent, you know, this month. So I, I, gotta, you know? I gotta go do it. But, and this is the only thing that's come across the table. And by the way, thank God that it did come across the table so I, I can hang on to my house. That's great. Um, but uh, you want to have the taste to be able to choose good projects. At least they're good on page. They have a great script. They have an interesting director. Some cool people are in it. Who knows what it's going to turn into, but I choose projects based on their, uh, the script and, and the people involved, but it's got to be something that's going to be fun for me to play and for you to watch. Is that, that I can take control of for the most part. I can have fun in a part that I'm having fun playing and I can make it enjoyable for you to watch. Everything else might suck, but that I can pretty much get, get across the line. You know, the editor might fuck it up. The director might DP somebody yeah, yeah, yeah. where it becomes unrecognizable, but at least it starts out where that was a fun part and, and a fun to watch. Yeah. And, and there was a, a, a good friend of mine who's an, an actor. He's like, Alex, sometimes I got to take alimony movies. Uh, I, I, they're called alimony movies. He's like, I know they yeah. suck. They're horrible. I'm, I leave town when they get released, but right. I yeah. got to do you what I got to do. Too many of those, you know, you exactly. <laughs> but as Robert Duvall said, you know, he said one for the art, one for the condo. <laughs> Great quote. That's amazing. Now I do have to ask you uh, about a little short film you made called The Punisher Dirty Laundry, Dirty Laundry, which I, I mean, and by the way, I loved your Punisher. I loved the way you played the character. I, I you know, you are so amazing in that film. And when yeah. I saw the, the, the short come out, I'm like, well, the cool level of Thomas Jane just went up because he made a, uh, a, 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 just a short film, a fan film almost. Yep. How did that come out? How did you get involved with that? How did that even get made? I wasn't fully satisfied with, the Punisher film that I did only because I had a vision, the vision that I had of the Punisher was slightly different than the slightly comic book version that uh, we ended up doing. And I'm proud of that film and it's got a lot of fans. And so I'm not taking anything away from the movie and Jonathan Hensley did a great job. You know, it was, I think it was his first. It was his first director. He was a really successful writer of blockbuster films and he wrote this and they gave him the, the chance to direct it. He gave it everything I had. I gave it everything I had. So there's a lot to be said for the film, but it is more the character. I felt there was more to that character. There was, and I wanted, so I was laying around one day and I came up with that story. I was like, God, you know, and, and somebody had said something to me at a lunch or something, you know, they said, you know, you just need something to dine out on, you know, you need something that people are talking about this week and you down out on it. Somebody called, Hey, I'll t- let me take you to lunch. You know? And, and I thought, yeah, all right, well, if I did a short film <laughs> and I came up with a story, I thought it was great. I had, I was, uh, Chad St. John, who's a wonderful writer, was a buddy of mine at the time. 
went to his wedding and uh, we were trying to get different projects off the ground at the time. And he, he, he had this terse, wonderful Walter Hill kind of style of writing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely loved. So I called him up and I said, Hey, I've got this outline, you know, and uh, this is my, my thing. I want to make it in 10 minutes. And he wrote it. He wrote it in a weekend. And then I went to Phil Joanu, who I would, who I had worked with on a, on a Blumhouse movie. Um, and I said, I asked him because Phil did a lot of commercials. He probably mm -hmm. still does. He did a lot of commercials. So he had, and he shot in town a lot. So he had crew that depended on him to, for their livelihood. Mm -hmm. So, and Phil, of course, fantastic state of grace. I mean, he's just a Amazing. fantastic talent. And I thought that's a great combination. And then I put, and then I went to another buddy in, who uh, was a producer, and I, and I said, you know, this this won't cost us very much because Phil is going to pull in a favor from his crew, you know, on a weekend he's going to pull in favors from. We got our crew together, we got our special effects together, we got the whole damn thing together. It all came together, and uh, and uh, you know, and I I put it that was sort of my first foray into producing and uh, making projects happen. And, and from that led to Renegade, my company. Mm -hmm. So I'm proud of that one. Very proud of it. It's, it's a, it's, it was such a fun, fun, fun short to watch. Now yeah. tell me about your new project, Tropo. Tropo. So Tropo means uh, it's an Australian slang word for going crazy in the tropical heat. Like, <laughs> When you go up north, Australia, north, the, the more north it gets, the hotter it gets in Australia because it's mm -hmm. upside down. And the northern most you go, the hotter it gets and it just and until it just gets tough, the humidity. And so people literally lose their mind up there. And uh, so they've got a word for it. It's called going tropo. It's when, <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you tear your clothes off and run down the middle of the street yelling like Tarzan, you've gone tropo. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, and uh, I thought it was a great title. It's not the title of the book. The title of the book is called Crimson Lake mm -hmm. and it's by Candace Fox. She's a fantastic writer out of Sydney. Uh, James Patterson tapped her to co-write some books. So that's wow. how good she is. Wow. If, you, if you're into the mystery novels, Candace Fox is what, definitely one to look up. Her, the, the second one is called Redemption Point. Those two, and then there's a third one too. Those are great, great mystery books. Really nicely done. Why? Because they're all about character. Anybody can sort of put together a kind of a mystery. Well, not anybody, but mysteries are one thing that you can engineer. The thing that I think separates uh, a good mystery from a great one is the characters. And that the mystery is ultimately about solving some mystery within yourself. You know, mm -hmm. those are the kind of character driven <clears throat> material that I'm looking for, especially with Renegade. So we've got this, uh, we've got this great book and uh, we, this is about two years ago and we went through the process of developing it. And, you know, this, this was brought to us by a company, an Australian company, and they were interested in doing a co-production. And so those building pieces, building blocks were already in place. We came on more of the creative end working with the showrunner, working with the creative producers, protecting the material, mm -hmm. making sure that, that what I loved and what we loved about the novel actually made it onto the screen. And for the most part, we were successful. The show opened in Australia two months ago and did very well. And the most gratifying thing is that the fans of Candace Fox in Australia uh, love the show. So we didn't fuck it up. So that, that, that was good. That was really good to hear. And now it's a matter of how the American audiences will respond to it. The only one of the changes we made was she wrote, she's an Australian writer writing out of Sydney and all of her characters in the novel were Australian. And the lead character is this guy, Ted Concafi. He's a disgraced cop. He's, he's a good detective accused of a horrible crime. And I was interested in, what does a detective do? He, he seeks the truth. He's a truth seeker. If he's good at it, he 
needs to seek the truth, right? He's passionate about it. The way I'm passionate about acting, the way you're passionate about directing, this guy's passionate about seeking the truth. And that passion, that truth seeking thing, that inability to leave something alone that you have to sneak in there and find out what's going on is what led to him getting accused of this horrible crime. You know, if he had just left well enough alone, it would have just been another day. But because he's a truth seeker, it ruined his life. So the core of that is, you know, what happens when the thing that I do best, the thing that I am ruins my life? You know, Mm -hmm. that was fascinating to me. And uh, I uh, and the and the other lead character is Amanda. So they've got these two leads and they couldn't be. She is this young 20 something shaved head tattooed badass crazy person who just got out of prison she spent a decade in prison for killing her best friend in high school so she's you know this is, these are not two people that were going to be hanging out together in a bar at all mm-hmm. but because and she got out of prison and then went back to the town where she committed the murder and opened up a detective agency but she doesn't know how to be a detective she has not the first fucking thing about it so she figures she sees me and knows that I am an ex-detective. And she figures, well, this, this guy, this is what I need. And they start this uneasy relationship, you know, and the only reason Ted takes the gig, it, he doesn't take the gig. Don't get me wrong. He's like, all right, I'll, I'll do this once. I'll, I'll go ask these questions, but that's it. He's constantly trying to get out of it. But the thing that keeps pulling him back in is that glimmer of hope. You know, that because he's a truth seeker, he, it's, right. it's just that glimmer of being able to do what he does best. Uh, so really neat story. Great characters. Um, and, and where is it going to be? And it's going to be played on. Is it freebie? Amazon. Yeah. If you go to Amazon and then I think there'll be a banner for freebie, freebie. which used to be the IMDB TV app. OK. Um, and now now they changed the name to freebie. Anyway, there'll be a banner on top of uh, Amazon. Tropo. It'll okay. be easy to find on Amazon. Now I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my guests. What advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Um, run. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That advice has been said on the show many times. <laughs> <laughs> it's not too far from the truth. You want to be a filmmaker. Um, well, what you do is you make films. Mm -hmm. don't wait around for uh, somebody to hand you a bunch of money a lot of folks out there are waiting around for somebody to hand them a bunch of money a lot i would even say maybe most Mm -hmm. agreed it's you want to put the pedal to the metal put your money where your mouth is you know you have and coppola said this years ago i remember coppola giving a great speech about and this was right at the dawn of cell phones you know right at the dawn i think i think it was uh the iPhone one had just come out and he goes, you got one of these, you got no excuses. I mean, he was blown away by the technology uh, and he's right. I mean, there's a great film called Tangerine all mm-hmm. shot on the Sean, iPhone. Yeah. Sean know, Baker. Soderbergh shot on the iPhone. Look, you got no excuse. You want to make the, if you're a filmmaker, where's your film? Where's your film? If you're a painter, where's your painting? <laughs> there it is. And, and, and it doesn't even have, you know, you don't even need actors. I mean, one of the greatest movies I've seen in a long time was called The Bear. Oh, was, oh, yeah, the 89. I remember very well. Oh, it's a French sorry. film. It's a French film. Such a good movie. It, 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 is, it is a bear. It's about a bear and a, and a baby bear. And it's their adventures through the wild. It's absolutely gorgeous. You know, you should be able to tell a story with rocks with smiley faces on them. You know, I'm not kidding. It's yeah, not a great. You, well, no, you I, should be able to tell a compelling story with emotion and everything you want to get across using sock puppets. Okay. So there's no excuse. Uh, there's, there's never, a, never an excuse, you know, and, and it's fun. The challenge of it is amazing. And then, you know, and then you've got the puzzle. How am I going to come up with something that people want to watch and that people maybe haven't seen before? Or how am I going to come up with something that they have seen before, but I'm going to do it better than anybody else? Um, it's, it's just a potpourri of delights out there. 
right now. And, and you can all, you can do it with just whatever's in your house, you know, the, the computer, the phone, oh, yeah. off to the races. Really it's fun. A- There's a really neat uh, lens that came out a couple of years ago. That's a, a two, three, five. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's a, it's a, and, and you sl- you slip it on to your iPhone. Have you seen yep. that? Oh, it's amazing. You know, it's amazing. Ass. It's really well done. It's, it's not cheap. And it's well ground. The lens is really well ground. And it'll give you that widescreen format on your mm-hmm. phone. No, that's amazing. Oh, yeah, I had fun playing with that for a long time. And two last questions. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Oh, my God. Uh, what are hard lessons to learn, you know? Um, I guess one of the hardest lessons to learn is that I'm good enough. That's been that, that exact answer has been said multiple times on this on the show. Well, it's true, mm-hmm. you know. You know, mm-hmm. I, and and I, as an actor, I got to tell you, it took me a long time to become an actor that that I would want to watch. You know, that I I had problems. I had problems being in front of the camera. I had problems being on set. I was nervous. I was uh, I had the imposter syndrome. I had a real um, difficulty calming down enough so that I could concentrate enough and relax so that I could do what I wanted to do because I, I'd be great in my bathroom and, <laughs> and, and, and rehearse and yeah. all the lot, you know, and I, and I knew the character that I wanted to bring to life and it wasn't, wasn't coming out, you know, it's just like, that is not what I saw when I was laying on my couch daydreaming about what this part was, you know, or right. doing my research. Uh, and it took me a long time to be able to relax and, uh, and, f- and f- you know, and part of that is sort of a, you know what, this is what I got, you know, and, and I'll, I'll, that is liberating. Uh, and last, yeah, and last, well, and last question, three of your favorite films of all time. Oh my gosh. Three of my favorite films that come to mind today. Oh, come on. Right. <laughs> they come to mind today. Well, I've got to mention the samurai films right now. So that counts samurai- as why. Well. Yeah. Samurai one, two, and three. There's sure. three. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd, I'd call that one movie. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, now you now you're gonna have me kicking myself later on. Uh, okay, here's a great film you should check out. Blast of Silence. You mm-hmm. heard of that one? No, I'm not. It's an old. I'm a real big fan of noir. This is a late noir. It was low budget. Low budget. If you guys are if you guys are all filmmakers out there, you got to check out Blast of Silence. Okay. I don't, I think this guy maybe directed one or two things and I can't remember his name, unfortunately, but black and white, early sixties. So late noir period crime movie called the blast of si- or just blast of silence. I think even criterion might have put that out. Okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll look for it. All right. There's, there's two, right. Mm-hmm. And uh, let's see. Number three. Um, you know, I mean, the movie that has stayed with me and changed my life and made me want to, that changed my life was Alien. Oh, Alien a- changed. I was eight years old, right? And I always say, I think I've said this in a hundred interviews, but, but people ask me. And so that's the truth. Uh, but I was eight years old. My, my folks, you know, they didn't have money for a babysitter. So they drag us kids. My sister was only five. You know, I, I, but that movie made a huge impression on me. I, I got the booklet. My dad, I made my dad buy me the, the they used to hand him sell these books and it was full of uh, information and pictures. I took that to school and I told all, because my buddies were not going to see Alien, you know, their parents were not taking them to Alien. <laughs> so I, I acted out the whole movie for all my friends over and over again. And I, and that was the beginning. Thomas, it's been an absolute honor and privilege talking to you, my friend. Thank you so much for entertaining us for all these years. And I'm so looking forward to seeing all the new projects you do with Renegade and the stuff that you're doing in the future, my friend. Thank you again. And thank you for being so honest and raw and, and, and forthcoming about all this information. Hopefully it's going to help some filmmakers out there. So I appreciate it. I hope so, buddy. It was great talking to you. Thank you. Thanks for having me on.